Good afternoon, Nguyen. We are waiting for a couple of minutes, and once we have enough students, get this sorted. Thank you. Good afternoon, Porti. Good morning again. Uh, let's just start week eight uh, lecture now. Hopefully, um, we'll have more participants soon. Today, we are going to continue the concept of internal load estimation inside the beam element. So if you remember from last week, um, we have started to explore a new type of structural element. This new element that is called beam. So it is very critical. Uh, one should be able to make distinction between the beam and bar. This might be sometimes confusing because from geometrical perspective, um the the geometry does not determine whether the structure is beam or bar that's a combination of the geometry and the load so um one easy way i suggested <clears throat> in last week if you want to distinguish between the beam and bar is you have to visualize that if this structure is loaded like so how does it deform? So can you visualize how the structure deforms? Sometimes it's not very difficult to visualize. I mean, in the case of this one, if I ask you, there is, what, what this structure is, that is a lifting device for heavy um, equipment. I, I think that the repair shop, and they want to lift something like, like an engine, which is um, not safe by a human, even if a couple of people try to lift it. So that device is utilizing a pulley system. So one is pulling the one end of the chain, 
and the other end moves in the opposite direction. So you're pulling down the chain downward and the lifting force is exerted to the object and it moves upward. So <clears throat> this is a pulley system and pulley is classified as a pin joint structure. And we know that tension here and W on this side, they're equal if you ignore the friction. So that part of the structure you are familiar with from uh, chapter from week one to week seven. The remaining of the structure, so imagine that you have a big load applied here. And can you visualize this structure? How does it deform? All right, so I would say this structure would go, I, I is exaggerating this one, that one would bend. So the radius of curvature here, this is a straight, after deformation, the radius of curvature changes. And this one, also the radius of curvature changes before that's a straight line. After this becomes a bent structure, a curved structure. So if I want to classify this horizontal one and this vertical one, I classify them as beam, this one as beam, and this one as a cable. And this one is a pin joint pulley. Okay. All right. So I hope that that's clear. Uh, if if you have any difficulty to visualizing how this structure deforms, please let me know. I'm happy to explain this with different uh, in a different way. All right. Now it comes my second question. My second question is why this beam it has that odd shape here or why this beam the vertical one why this is being uh, which i mean you see that these tiny rods are being welded to this beam at few points so can you can you justify why people did that is that for the sake of aesthetic or this has something to do with the performance. All right, the answer to that question is this structure has been reinforced. So we have locally made this structure stronger near that corner, and we made this structure stronger at this end. So that somehow is an indication of this beam does not have a uniform internal load. Some internal loads are larger than the other. I mean, if I want to see how the internal forces are changing here, even without knowing anything about the mechanics, if the person who designed that knew what they were doing, um, they are telling me that this part of a structure, internal loads are stronger than this part. So they have made this portion of a structure stronger to prevent that from um, breaking off. I mean, they could have made the entire structure stronger, but that was um, just overkill. They only needed to reinforce the structure here and reinforce the structure here. And that is telling me that in a beam, internal forces, They are not constant. Can you live with that? So it is telling me that the internal force inside the beam, they are changing longitudinally, axially. Or maybe they are changing in a transverse direction as well. So this is, this is the axial direction of the beam. And that is the transverse direction of the beam. With this beam speaking, that is the axial, and this is the transverse direction, right? So from this image, my conclusion is the internal forces in a beam are changing um, in different points of the beam. The 
the internal force are not constant. This is in contrast with a chain. This is in contrast with a bar. So if I had a bar which is loaded like that, so internal force in all these points, they do not change. But, but if this is a beam, the internal force from this point to this point, the internal force are not the same. That is a very important conclusion. All right, from that conclusion, it explains why we have to find out the internal force as a function of position. So when you dealt with the truss structure, let's take a simple truss structure. Right, in this truss structure, no matter what the loads, we only are interested in finding internal forces and they don't change from point to point. But in a beam, if you go axially or transversely, the internal forces, they do change. And between now and end of semester, uh, we want to find out how these forces are going to change. And today, I'm going to start some <clears throat> um, cases. So, well, there are different ways you can classify a beam structure. One simple classification is if the beam is sitting on simple supports like, like the hinge and roller. So this is a simple, we call this a simply supported. Or a beam could be restricted in a more complex way. So this is a cantilever. Right, so either the force is distributed or that's that's a uniform load. So that is the second type, more complex. This is the first one. But either way, if I have a beam, let's remember that making a cross section inside the beam. If I make a cross section, there will be three internal forces inside. The first one is the axial. We call this N. The second one is the shearing one, shear force, we call that V of X. And the third one is the bending moment or M of X. So why do I call this as a function of X? Because like I explained in the case of the beam, these three forces in the most general case, they do change through the axial direction. And then maybe they also change in the transverse direction. <clears throat> All right, so this is an example. Here I have a simply supported beam. And in this simply supported beam, we start with finding the reactions before we get into variation of internal forces in the left hand side, right hand side of the P. But from an Ibert view, I know that the deformation of this structure would be something like this. So here I have radius of curvature change before and after loading. So before you load, this is straight. After you load, it becomes curved. So in another word, your beam is laughing. I mean, it could have been the case your beam is crying. So that is the first case, and this is the second case. So here, I mean, I can imagine that the deformation would be something of this type, all right? So I'm ex exaggerating to show you that it doesn't remain straight. It, it's not limited to the elongation or shrinkage. Also, the radius of curvature changes. Okay, any question? Any question at all? Okay, so we want to find out the variation of the internal forces. First, we start with the variation in the axial direction. And later, when we are in a more advanced level, we also study how 
in the y direction, these internal forces might change. So, all right, this illustration is very useful in a sense that I have a mixed loading. What I mean by mixed loading is there is a combination of the distributed load and the point load. So, would you try partitioning this structure into uh, how many zones? How many zones of loading are here? If you if you try if you would partition this beam to a number of different zones, how many regimes of loading are here? How many zones of loading are here? Let me ask this question by posting a multi choice question. Can you try answering this question, multi choice question, please? All right, I got one correct answer from Porti. Well done, Porti. Your answer is correct. And well, the answer I have from Nguyen. Nguyen, you want to reconsider your answer? And also, what about Darcy? Darcy, can you tell me what do you think? How many regimes of loadings are here? All right. Thank you, Darcy. The correct answer is by Porti, and he um, correctly identified three zones of the loading. The first zone is between here and there. So when between point O and whatever that point is, that the loading is only by distributed load. If I do my free body diagram from left to right, I see that between O and the end of here, the loading is only governed by that distributed load. So the second load is when I go from here to there. Okay, so here I have one distributed load plus an unloaded zone. So that is the second zone. And here I have a discontinuity. So the left value of the loading with the right value of the loading, there is a discontinuity here. So this is the um, discontinuity point. And therefore, um, right-hand side, I have another zone. So this is zone number one, this is zone number two, and this is zone number three. The correct answer is by 40. Can I ask everyone else to go back and correct their answer? If you, if you understood what, what I just demonstrated, just go and change. All right, let me let me explain. Thank you, Nguyen. Let me explain. So the thing is, I want to find out the internal forces as a function of x. So I want to write v of x, m of x, and n of x. So I reckon that there are going to be three of them. I have to write one v of x when x is changing between 0 to a. Also, I will have another v of x when x is changing between a and b. And also, there will be another internal force when x is changing between b and l. So these are the definition of three. In another word, I need three solutions to describe the variation of internal load over the entire span. I can't describe V of X only by making one free body diagram here. So if I make one free body diagram here, what I obtain as a V of X, that is only the description of the situation between here and there. If, if I need to know the variation of V of X here, that free body diagram is not enough. I need to make one free body diagram here. 
And then even by doing that, I'm only able to describe the variation between X from here to there. And if I want to know what is happening here, I need to make another free body diagram. So three free body diagram is the minimum I need to find out the variations. That is a important, not, not very difficult. If I give you some examples, very soon you will be able to find out how many zones of deformation are here. Okay. For now, just take it as, as Corti picked up. There are three zones. It means I need to make separate free body diagrams to understand how internal forces would change inside the structure. Okay, let me show you, um, or maybe by solving this problem, you would agree with me that there are three zones here. So these zones are defined as X changing between zero to A, between A and B for the second zone and between B and L for the third zone. So the most critical load inside the beam, generally speaking, the most critical are the shear force and the bending moment. So these two are the most critical. And N is simple. Most of the cases, N, we can find them easily. But finding the shear force and bending moment is quite difficult. So you have to either solve a complex free body diagram, or you have to use the mathematical method, which is based on the method of equation. And I'm going to explain that uh, soon for you. But before doing that, let me remind you the conventions. You remember that last week we uh, discussed about the conventions. If I'm making the free body diagram, depending if I'm taking the left-hand side free body diagram or the right-hand side free body diagram, the way I show the positive shear, positive bending, positive normal, are different with that of the right-hand side. So according to this convention, if my free body diagram is on the left-hand side, positive shear is down. If I'm taking right-hand side, the positive shear would be facing up. If I'm making a left-hand side free body diagram, the bending moment in counterclockwise is positive. And if I'm taking right-hand side, the positive bending moment would be this way. Because here, both of these are making my beam to deform like that. So they're the same thing, but opposite direction. Also, here, that's a negative one. That makes my beam to deform like that. This one makes my beam to deform like that. So that, that explains why they are um, like so. That is called beam convention. And this is the positive shear. That is the positive bending. And this is making the beam change its radius of curvature like so. That's the positive. And let's start with the procedures of analysis. Now we want to start given a beam. Let's find out the internal forces or internal load inside the beam structure. The first step is um, we have to find out the support reactions. And finding support reactions, in many cases, it requires you to convert the distributed loads into the point load. So you have to convert them in point load in order to um, find the reactions. This is most of the cases, the situation is like that.
All right, so first step, we replace the distributed load with the result and the line of action. So that is the first step you take to find out the reaction force. Once you have the reaction force, then you need to find out how many zone of deformation zone of deformation or zone of loading are there how many regimes and then there are three internal forces you have to identify first you have to find out how n changes second find out how shear force changes and third find out how bending moment changes in an axial direction as a function of x and that is exactly what we want to do just remember that Shear force, that is a function of x. So it makes sense to plot them. Once something is changing, it makes sense to plot them because a plot visually shows us which part of the beam is critical. Also, bending moment is a function of x. It makes sense to plot them. And in this way, we know which part of the beam goes through the positive bending, negative bending, what is the maximum bending, what is the maximum shear, whether the shear is positive, negative. All these questions by having a <clears throat> plot that can be um, visually identified very quickly. So let's start with this example. I would like to give you five minutes. So please take five minutes and try to find out how does V of X and M of X changes in this beam. So here, I want you to plot V of X, M of X, and that being X direction, that being the Y direction. I give you six minutes. Please give it a go, and then we try that together. Six minutes to start now.
Anyone had a chance with this problem? Uh, shall we start? Or if you want to share your solution, you're more than welcome. OK, so first thing first, we have to find the reactions. So this is a symmetric shape. So it's not difficult to find out that these are 2.5, 2.5 here. OK. So let me bring that into a separate page. We can deal with it in a neat, clean way. All right, so that is a simply supported beam. And this one has a five kilonewton right in the middle and 2.5 here, 2.5 here. Let's use the label. This is A, that is point C, this is point B. Okay, who can tell me how many zones of loading are here? How many zones? Darcy, how many zones are here? Nguyen? Uh, there are two. Actually, there are two. Yes, there is two. Uh, a, B, and B, C. So, so zone number one, that is exchanges between zero to two. So in that sense, I can make a free by diagram of the left hand side. So left hand side free by diagram would be something like that. I have to cut this. It starts from A, that is 2.5. And here I have a distance of X. And at this X, because I'm cutting that, this is a beam. Every time you cut a beam, there will be three types of internal load. The one with the N of X, that's the positive N of X. The second one would be V of X, positive. And the third one is M of X, positive. All right, so you have to find out three internal forces. N of X is simple because all forces are vertical, so this is zero. So what can you tell me about V of X? So V of X is equal to 2.5. And what can you tell me about M of X? M of X, if I take net rotation with respect to point A, or yeah, point A, that is V of X multiplied by X. That is, in a negative sense, minus 2.5 X plus m of x is equal to zero. So therefore, in the first zone, I have m of x is equal to 2.5x, v of x and n of x. So let's make a plot. I'm making a plot of the first zone. The first zone is x is changing between 0 to 2. And this is V of X. So I don't have to worry about N of X. This is zero. So we don't plot that. But, but to plot this one, between zero to two, it starts from 2.5. And it goes to, it's constant, positive. All right. So this is almost point B. Just, just before point B, that is 2.5. What happens after point B? So I'm talking about discontinuity. Here I have a discontinuity into shear. So here I have to push this down by five kilonewton. Right? It comes to here. From 2.5, it comes to minus 2.5. Right? And then how do I plot M of X? So M of X, this is the equation of a line. At 
x equal to zero is zero at x equal to two, that is equal to five Newton meter, five Newton meter here. So and it changes linearly up to here. If I make the free body diagram for the second zone, the second zone is x between two and four. So here my free body diagram would look like this one. This time that is x, and this is v of x, this is n of x, and that is m of x. So in the second zone, I, I can show you that v of x is equal to minus 2.5, and m of x, is it has a non-zero distance from the origin. So m of x becomes like so, this one becomes like so, and that is the reaction here. So that is C. Uh, no, in the right hand side is not 2.5. That is minus 2.5. Minus 2.5 kilonewton. Yep, that's minus 2.5, not positive 2.5. So left hand side is positive, right hand side is negative. So here both sides are positive. And if you want to see the derivation of the bending moment, I mean that is not the optimum way we solve this problem. The optimum way, I mean, in the, in the right-hand side, the m of x is 10 minus 2.5x. So this equation is that is for the second zone. And n of x is equal to zero. <clears throat> All right, so please listen carefully. I'm going to give you a very convenient um, technique. So this convenient technique is whenever there are zones of deformation like we have here. I mean, let me write down for you the zones. The first zone is zone number one. That is X changing between zero to two. Well, when it comes to the second zone, one option is I write X between two and four, or from now on, instead of writing it this way, I want to do a very convenient way. So instead of fixing the coordinate system to point A, I'm going to move the coordinate system with my zone. When I jump into the second zone, I bring that coordinate system from here, I bring it to here. What happened? If I bring it here, instead of changing between zero to four, it would change between zero and two. So everyone followed the change of coordinate system. If you didn't, just let me know. I'm happy to explain again. Okay, no, yeah, let, let me explain again. So I start from a fresh page. So in this fresh page, so how many zones are here, no, yeah? There are two zones, right? You agree there are two zones? So in, in one alternative, I keep my coordinate system fixed to here. So in my coordinate system are fixed here, zone number one is X changes between zero to two, and zone number two, X changes between two and four. So this is no problem with that, Nguyen, right? Now, I want to do the same 
problem, but in this case, So in this second case, instead of keeping the coordinate system here, when I go from zone number one to zone number two, I would like to move the coordinate system to the second zone here. Now, if, if I detach the coordinate system from here, and bring that to here, what happens? Now, when I'm writing zone number two, I assume that now my coordinate system is here, y, x. Now, instead of x changes between two and four, x will change again between zero to two. Nguyen. Is this more clear or still you want me to clarify? Uh, Darcy, Nguyen, Ahmed, Porti, is that clear? Do you understand what I'm trying to say? So from now on, how many zones are there? If there are three zones, when you are writing the equation, you shift the coordinate system at the beginning of the zone that you are working with. Here I'm working at zone number one. I keep the coordinate system at the beginning. Now I am at zone, zone two, make that at the beginning of zone two. If there were three zones, like we, what we had before, so here I have three zones, right? Zone number one, zone number two, zone number three. So if I am staying at the first zone, writing the expression, I put my coordinate system here, exchanges between here and there. If I'm writing the equations of the internal force for the second zone, I put my coordinate system here. Now the zero, my, my new zero is here. If I'm working in the third zone, I put my coordinate system here. Now my in third zone, my zero would start from here. Who is it me? Please give me a quick feedback. I'm happy to clarify if anyone needs clarification. I'm waiting. Don't be shy. If you don't understand, let me know. I, I would explain again. But please give me a feedback. All right. So let me explain this with, with one example. Maybe, maybe one example makes this easier. All right, here we, have, we only have one zone. With one zone, we want to plot V of X, M of X, and N of X. Let's do that. Okay, um, Nguyen, how many zones, how many regimes of loading are here? <clears throat> 40, how many regimes of loading are here? Yes, one, correct, one, there's only one. All right, so, so this, is, if I want to write for zone number one, This is zone number one. X changes between three and, oh, sorry, between zero and three. All right? So hypothetically, if I had something like this one, how many zones were here? Two zones. Two meters here, 
two meter here. So when I write expression for zone number one, my X is changing, my coordinate system is attached to the beginning. So X starts from zero to two. So let's make this one five. Okay, two five. If I want to write the equation for zone number two, I bring my coordinate system here at the beginning. And now my X is changing between zero to five. That is, that is how we do it from now on. We move the coordinate system as we jump from equation from one zone to another zone. We keep changing the coordinate system at the beginning of the new zone. That, that is very simple. I mean, I'm sure if we go through, no, that is five. This is not three, that is five. That is five, between zero to five. This is not that complex as you think. I'm sure with a uh, few examples, you soon um, will, will grasp it. So here, I only need to make one free body diagram because there is one zone. So let me make the free body diagram for that. First thing first, I have to find the reactions. The reactions A of Y is equal to B of Y. The resultant is five kilonewton multiplied by three is 15. So you divide 15 by two, that is 7.5 kilonewton, right? So that is easy enough. The next thing is I make a free body diagram for the zone. And that is you have to cut this one at a distance of X. So you have to cut it here, which is X meter from the left hand side, from where your coordinate system is. This is your coordinate system. So this is my coordinate system. And for that coordinate system, I'm just considering lengths of X. So this is point A. 7.5 is here. And also, I only have a portion of the distributed load here. So this portion it has the resultant of five multiplied by X. So this is five multiplied by X. And the line of action here, the line of action is X by two, half X, right? So what about the other side? The other side, because this is a beam, I need to include three internal forces, N of X, V of X and M of X. All right, so now we easily find out that N of X is equal to zero because there is no horizontal force. And how do I find V of X? So let's take net forces vertically equal to zero. That is 7.5. Minus 5x minus v of x is equal to zero. And that is v of x is equal to 7.5 minus 5x. So that means at x equal to zero, uh, 5x, yeah, 5x, because, because this distributed load is only belonging to a span of x. So from here to there, you have only a portion of the distributed load, not, not the entire. The entire is five multiplied by three, which is 15. For this portion, which is only the length is X, the resultant force would be the intensity multiplied by the length. Five kilonewton multiplied by X, that is five X. All right, so now here I have the expression for V of X, which is, that expression. At x equal to zero, v of a is equal to 7.5, which is correct. At x equal to three, that is v of b, that is 7.5 minus 15, that is minus 7.5. Or should I say, yeah, that is minus 
it means my shear force changes like so. It starts from 7.5 here and it goes down to minus 7.5 here and finally it comes back with that reaction to here so 7.5 this is v of x that is x so we, we managed to get the shear force diagram the next thing is how do i find m of x let me take the moment of forces with respect to point A. So I write net rotation with respect to the point A equal to zero, and that being the positive direction. So that means 5x multiplied by half x, that is in a negative, that is minus 5x times half x. Also, I have V of X multiplied by X. So V of X multiplied by X, that is in negative direction, minus V of X. And the arm of rotation is X. And also M of X is positive, plus M of X is equal to zero. So if I solve that <coughs> relationship, that is m of x is equal to um, 2.5 2.5 x squared and then this is plus 7.5 x And this is 5x. So that is minus minus plus minus minus 5x squared. All right, so that is m of x is equal to minus 2.5 x squared plus 7.5 x. That is my m of x. All right, so that if I want to plot my m of x, that is, that is v of x. So how much rotation you get, because this is, this is v of x is this one. V of X is this one, 7.5 minus 5X. So that is V of X multiplied by X. This is the arm of rotation. That is the magnitude. The magnitude is 7.5 minus, uh, minus 5X. So that multiplied by this arm, that is the V multiplied by X. All right, now we can plot. We realize that this is a second order curve. If I plot X equal to zero, that give me X equal to zero. So that is m of 0 is equal to m of a. That is equal to 0. If I plug x equal to um, x equal to 3. No, no. We are we are taking we are taking rotation with respect to point A. With respect to A, the, the total span is x. So half x is when you have only this force making rotation. This force with respect to the A, the arm of rotation is half X, but V of X, the arm of rotation is full X, not half X. Is that okay? Yes, no? Okay, thank you, Noyen. All right, now, if I plug x equal to 3, if I plug x equal to z, uh, 3, that is m of b, 
that is m at x equal to three, that is minus 2.5 times nine plus 7.5 times nine. So that one is also equal to zero. All right, so here, this is a quadratic equation because the coefficient of the x squared is minus 2.5. That is reverse cup. So I know that here my bending moment starts from zero, ends at zero, and right in the middle, I would have this reverse cup. So that is the maximum bending taking place here. So that is when x is equal to 1.5. So if I plug x equal to 1.5, that is the amount of the maximum bending moment right in the middle. So that's being calculated here for you, which is right in the middle, you get 5.6245. And the unit is Newton meter. So the middle point, let's call this point C. So M of C, that is M evaluated at X equal to 1.5. That is 5.625 Newton meter, kilonewton meter. Okay, any question? <clears throat> All right, no question, let's move on. Okay, um, can I explain, can I explain four last rows? Okay, four last rows. I have to bring this free body diagram in another page. Let me bring that into a new page. So that is my beam with only a portion of the beam. I made a free body diagram here. So my free body diagram is here. I'm making a cut right over here. I'm making a cut here which is X meter from the left. So I'm cutting this here. And then I, this is my left-hand side free body diagram, left-hand side free body diagram. So I'm plotting that here. <clears throat> that is my left-hand side free body diagram. So this is point A, that is point X. So from here to there, the distance is X. So I should include a, distributed load, only a portion of the distributed load, not all of it. And that is the intensity is, the intensity is five. If I have five kilonewton per meter and that's X meter, the resultant, this is from last week, the resultant would be five X. And the distance from here to here, that is 0.5 X, all right? But what happens here in the right hand side because because we cut inside whenever you cut a beam the internal loads are three one is uh, v of x the next one is n of x and the last one is m of x so how do i solve this free body diagram i know that the reaction here is 7.5 okay so therefore, <clears throat> if I write net forces vertically equal to zero, that is 
minus 5x minus v of x is equal to 0. <clears throat> and that brings me to v of x is equal to 7.5 minus 5x. Correct? Now, let's put this number here. All right? I'm putting this number here. Because now I calculated it, I know that this is 7.5 minus 5x. OK, so can you help me with net rotation with respect to point A equal to 0? So with respect to the A, that won't make any rotation. That is 0. This one make a negative rotation. That is minus 5x. But the arm of rotation is half x. And how does this force make a rotation? That is in a negative direction, minus 7.5 minus 5x, the total, multiplied by arm of rotation is x. And then this one is positive plus mx equal to 0. If I simplify that expression, that gives me this expression here. And so the last three lines, I want to plot this quadratic curve. I want to plot this one. How do you plot? You plot by investigating few points. I'm investigating point one, which is x equal to zero. This is x zero. I investigate that at the end, which is x equal to three. That is x equal to three. And also I investigate that at point in the middle, point C, which is x equal to 1.5. And if you plug x 1.5 into this expression, the number is 5.625 kilonewton per meter. <clears throat> and this is the plot. Is that clear? All right. Thank you, Nguyen. Let's let's go to the next example we have. <clears throat> All right, so this is a relatively complex one. If you listen and learn this one, I think you would be off the hook, off the wood. First thing first, who can tell me how many zones of deformation are here? Okay, there is one zone of information for the distributed load. And then, yeah, left-hand side, right-hand side, because this is a discontinuity, there would be a change, a tiny change between the left-hand side and right-hand side here. Then you have one zone between here and there, and then you have one zone here. Yes, three is the correct number. Thank you, Noyen. We try to solve this one together. <clears throat> Okay, the first step is to find the <clears throat> reaction forces. Reaction forces at A and C, to find those, I have to lump the <clears throat> or concentrate the 10 kilonewton meter over four, that is four, 40 kilonewton right in two meters from point A. Hopefully everyone agrees with me on that. That is the easy part. And when you re replace the distributed load with the resultant, the beam can be solved for, for the 
support. <clears throat> and because I'm lazy, let me see if I have the number for that. No, we don't have the number for that. Okay, <clears throat> so I go back to this one. So you find A of X and you find C, of, sorry, A of X is zero, A of Y, you find C of Y, and that is all about the reaction. Zone number one, that is x changing between 0 to 4. And the free body diagram corresponding to that is like so. That is x, this is a. That is a of y. And then right in the middle, I have to replace only a portion of the distributed load. This is 10x. And this is going to be half x. And here you will have V of X, N of X, and M of X. So that is three unknowns, one, two, three, three equations. We can solve that for the first zone. All right? So I leave that for you to solve. And then I jump into the second zone. <clears throat> In the, yeah, before going to the second zone, Left hand side, right hand side, you will have a discontinuity of the shear. This is a shear force, 16 kilonewton. Whatever my end value is at this point, left hand side, when I jump to the right hand side, I have to push this down further 16 kilonewton. That is how this discontinues for four. And now with the second zone, that is, please listen carefully, with the second zone, I bring my coordinate system here. If I bring my coordinate system, all equations would be based on this x equal to 0 here, x equal to 3 here. So in the second zone, my x is changing between 0 to 3. And my free body diagram would be like that. And I'm going to have the entire distance as x. And the internal loads will be v of x, n of x, and m of x. All right? So in this zone, I have to solve three unknowns, three equations. So I solve and find these as a function of x. And finally, when you jump into the third zone, in the third zone, what happens? In the third zone, you're going to have A of Y here, C of Y here, 16 kilonewton here, distributed load like so. And then this dimension will be your new x. But in the zone 3, your coordinate system starts from, not here, your coordinate system starts from here. And then you have v of x, n of x, and m of x. So in this rewrite diagram, three unknowns, three equations, that is easily solvable. All right, so you find three separate expressions for shear force, bending moment, normal force. And you have to plot them side by side for each zone, All right? So you would plot V of X here, and you plot M of X here. All right, so that 
I gave you hint how to go about that one. The next example I'm going to full, fully solve. So let's take this one um, for next practice, next demonstration. All right, so none of these three examples have a full solution. You make a choice whether you want me to solve. That is a simple one. This is a medium one. And that this is a medium one. And that is a complex one. Which one would you like me to solve? We only have time for one. So you want something as simple as this one, or something medium like that, or something complex like this one? You want something simple, medium, complex. So let's do the medium one. That is the medium. Unless someone objects, I uh, will be doing this one. OK, what is the first step? The first step is to find the reactions, right? So let's find the reactions. So that is 2.8 multiplied by 2 So that is the result and force. This is the result and force I should put it right here. And how many zones? How many zones of deformations are here? Darcy, how many zones you identify here? Nguyen, 40. There are three. Three, three zones. Yes, Darcy is correct. 40 is correct. Thank you, Ahmed. There are three zones. Please watch the recorded uh, lecture where you missed this, and then you find out how we distinguish. So one zone is between A to D, the other zone is between D to B, the third zone is between D, B and E. But the first thing is you have to have the um, reactions before you can start plotting the internal forces. So I make a quick solution for that. So this is the entire beam. I want to find the reactions. This is point A. That is point B. This is point B. And that is point E. 12 here. 5.6 here. AY and BY. So how do I find BY? Net rotation with respect to the A equal to 0. That is minus 5.6 times 1.4 plus by multiplied by 2.834 multiplied by 4 and finally minus 12 multiplied by 5.5. That is dy is equal to
is 18.46. Eighteen forty six kilonewton. And then I could go and find the net forces in vertical direction equal to zero. That is A of Y plus 18.46 is equal to 17.6. Right? So A of Y is <coughs> minus point <coughs> eight six. All right, so let's just start with the first zone. <clears throat> X is changing between 0 to 2.8. So my pre by diagram looks like this one. And for this portion of the distributed load, that would be 2x. And the distance between here and that is half x. <coughs> so, Let's find out n of x is 0 in this zone. With v of x, I write the sum of the vertical forces. That is minus 0.86 minus 2x minus v of x is equal to 0. Therefore, v of x is minus 2x minus 0.86. So let's, if, if I want to plot, this is the equation of a line. How do you plot the equation of a line? 
So you just find out at the x equal to zero, that is 0.86, at x equal to uh, the end of this zone is 1, 2.4. End of the zone is 2.8. V at 2.8 is minus 2 times 2.8 minus 0.86. That is minus 6.46. So if I want to plot that, so V of X, it doesn't start from it, well, first <clears throat> it goes to minus eight six, and this is a line with a negative slope. It goes down to minus six point four six. All right, and what happens to the m of x? M of x, you have to solve this free body diagram. Let's take net rotation with respect to the a equal to zero. That is 2x multiplied by half x. This is x squared. And the rotation is negative. And v of x multiplied by x. This is v of x. If you multiply that by x, this is minus 2x2. minus 0.86 by x. And what about m of x? m of x is positive. So this one we can rearrange. If you rearrange this one, Yeah, by reorganizing this one, m of x is 3x squared plus 0.86x. So how do I plot this one? To plot that x at x equal to 0, m is 0. x equal to 2.8. M at point D all right so that is a quadratic with a reverse cup it starts from zero and it goes all the way to here And then between here and there, the shear doesn't change. Suddenly, you get this one going there. And finally, it comes down linearly like that. So this is minus, minus, plus. And your bending moment would change like this and come back like this one. So I leave the detailed derivation to you, but don't panic. This technique is only to show you how inconvenient that technique is.
the main technique which we are going to use for plotting that is not by free body diagram. So free body diagram that is not usable when you want v of x, m of x, n of x. It free body diagram is only useful if I give you a point, point C or point G, and ask you what is v of G, what is m of G, and what is n of G. That is only reason we use free body diagram to find internal forces. If I want the expressions like this one, free body diagram is the worst technique. You never use this one. I'm going to introduce a new technique tomorrow. So tomorrow we go through a technique that is called method of equation. Method of equation. So method of equation is far easier than free body diagram. If you want to derive the equation of x to find the variation of internal forces. So that is um, for today. What we did was first the procedure for finding variation of internal forces. That is, first you have to find out the reaction forces. Then you identify how many zones of deformations are here. In case if you have to deal with multiple zones, for each zone, we shift the coordinate system at the beginning of the zone that you are driving the expression for. Then we attempted a number of problems by free body diagram to find the variation of internal forces. But this is not the preferred technique for the variation. Free body diagram is only useful if I want to find the internal force at one certain point. If I want to see the variation as a function, I have to go to a mathematical uh, technique rather than the free body diagram technique. So. Tomorrow, I'm going to um, present to you a new technique for variation of internal forces. That is called method of equation. But tomorrow is the Anzac Day. This is a public holiday in Swinburne. What I do is I will be recording tomorrow's session and send you a link for watching that uh, recording. So that would be the makeup for, for today's class. Any questions? Is there any question? Or if if no question, just bear with me. Let me finish the attendance list, and then you are free to go. Yes, I will explain that. Let me let me finish uh, let me finish the attendance and I explain rotation about A. Thank you. Or I'm not happy with the large number of uh, absentees we have today. So it seems Sehri is the regular absentees. Um, Natasha sometime come late. Today she's mis uh, absent. Aiden Chaisal frequently missing the classes. Daniel, so, Abdullah, so. Ahmed, you have to come to classes more. Nijil have missed so many classes, so um, not a good sign. Barnaby, Clean, Shah. Thank you, Darcy, for coming to class. Porti Nguyen, your gentleman. Uh, all right, so. <clears throat> so
So let me make sure that Ahmed is also the in. All right, now I had a question from Corti. He wants to know how the rotation about point A is working. So Corti, for that, um, I need to make one section at this point. So I have to make a section, and this section is measured x from this end, x. So if this is x, I only will have a portion of distributed load. So this portion, 40, is going to be x multiplied by 2. That will be 2x. So this is 2x. But this 2x is measured by half x from left. Does that make sense? And also, I have to release that from here, which makes this one A of Y. And this distributed force, we replace that by 2X. And what happens to the bleeding at here? Bleeding, because you cut the section, internal forces would be three. V of X, N of X, M of X. N of X is equal to zero because there is all forces are vertical. To find out V of X, I have to write the sum of the forces in the vertical direction equal to zero. That is what I did, and I obtained an expression of V of X with respect to the X. How do I find M of X? M of X, let's take rotation with respect to the A. That is 2X multiplied by half X, which is X squared. X squared but that is in the negative direction. That's a clockwise, that's negative. The second one is V of X with respect to here. V of X, we already have this, that is V of X, multiply by the arm of rotation, which is X. And then sine is negative, minus that one is multiplied by X. And finally, you have a positive rotation, which is M of X. So that expression, if you reorganize that, it would be your expression of m as a function of x. But like I said, don't panic. We won't be using free body diagram to drive expressions like this one, because that that's always requires too much algebra. And we won't be doing that. We provide a more convenient technique that is called method of equation. Tomorrow, that would be uh, presented as a recorded session, because tomorrow is a public holiday. No, uh, Darcy, for tomorrow, there will be a recorded uh, video. All right, any, any other question? Any other question? All right, no question. Thanks everyone. Thank you very much for coming to class and I look forward to see you on Wednesday. Take care, see you then, bye. See you Ahmed, thank you, thank you. See you there. Thank you, Porti.